Uh, my name is Chris Maestas. I work at IBM here as the chief executive architect for storage solutions and unstructured interactions with data and AI. Uh, again, I've been in this business for over 20 years. My background is in high performance computing. I worked on IB, IBM SP1s, SP2s, uh, those types of systems. I worked again, TSM, HSM, worked with file systems like Lustre, PBFS, uh, Panassis, NetApp, came to IBM in 2012 and been doing, you know, the whole solutioning that we have here uh, in, in IBM. And one of the things you've heard uh, terminology like data lake before. And in 2016, 2017, everyone was buy a data lake, buy a data lake. And people started to buy a lot of point solutions. You bought maybe some NetApp, you bought some PowerScale, you bought some IBM storage, right? And you sort of grew that out. And then you needed to worry about how do I get data moving back and forth, right? And really the story and what Matt was sort of talking about this global data platform, it doesn't matter where the data is at, I should be able to connect to it. And even now in this year, we're now worried about that dispersed data lake mentality. People are getting fined for sharing data they shouldn't. Right, you're sort of having data leave a country. So now you're gonna see GDPR fines. We're seeing other states in the US create their own laws on privacy protection. We've seen other countries around the world. So now you have this whole resurgency of private regulations. And still, we were telling this story with the data and AI ladder here at IBM, at IBM Think in San Francisco, I think this was in 2019. And we were sort of talking about this AI ladder and what is sort of, you know, there is no AI with, uh, without IA. And what we were highlighting even then was we're spending a boatload of time trying to find the data. When we get to actually running, and whether it was a Power 9 AC 922, it was an NVIDIA DGX1 kind of box, that stuff ran fast. And those guys were out there like, this is great, it's gonna make all your workload. But we, for we neglected to sort of think about, I got all this computational power, I got nothing, if I don't have a network and I don't have storage and I got to find out where that data is at. So we're still seeing this even today, the collection, the preparation. And in that kind of you know, environment, we started to see these use cases and it's been evolving over time, this high speed ingest type of use case, where in life sciences, in, uh, in physics with you know, customers like Desi, you have these instruments now the University of Queensland is spoken in our spectrum scale user group. They are generating boatloads of data. And this data may be talking an odd protocol like SIFS, SMB. It may be talking S3. And it may be storing that data there and pushing it to a high performance tier. So we were analyzing that data. And then what we wanted to do was like, well, that was at a remote site. That instrument is there on the beam line or a sequencer, or again, it's generating data. How do I get it over here to that DGX box I got? You know, and what we were sort of thinking about our story and as we've been evolving it in the global data platform is I, I can tag the data, I can prepare it for actually running the jobs. And when it's time to do a Spark workload, when it's time to do the DGX you know, kind of environment, that data, which again, this is where your business value is in, in the results and the inferencing you're doing, is ready to go. So I could connect to that high performance tier. I can then save that data to an archive. That archive could be an object store. I'm an IBMer, it could be tape. Hmm. Tape is actually a really good kind of, kind of environment. And I can save it for later, maybe for compliance reasons, but you'll see in one of these other problems we had, the cold data problem I'll talk about as well, there is actually additional insight you get from the cold data you've had lying around for many years. We also used to see this with autonomous driving. I'll be actually be speaking at a conference in a couple of weeks uh, in Anaheim to talk about ADAS and what we're doing in the global data platform there. I spoke there last year as well. But with autonomous driving, we see transient data. So these use cases where I have data that's being collected, maybe there's a car, maybe there's a drone, Maybe there's a ship that's going out there, collecting a lot of data, bringing it back to port, where then 
maybe uploading it to a cloud or another storage environment. We're going to tag that data, prepare it for the modeling. And then again, this kind of song and dance here, right? This is, the, this is the easy song and dance, right? Running the modeling, getting the insights, that's where the value in what you're doing. And finally, again, highlighting, you can sort of get that data and push it into an archive. So high-speed ingest, autonomous vehicles, Internet of Things. So maybe I'm collecting pictures, I'm collecting temperature data, I'm collecting, you know, my appliances call home. You know, it's sort of talking to me as like, you know, you need a new water filter, Chris, on your refrigerator. You haven't replaced it, right? So not, not that I have that, that kind of Samsung refrigerator, but you could. But that might be pushing to a cloud kind of environment. And a story I think I'll share with you is I, I was actually literally going around the world. I was in Singapore, I was in Spain, I came actually home, and mobile passport control, best thing ever when you come back to the States. Take a picture of yourself, took a picture of my wife, which been with me, and from the time from the plane that I walked up to the passport control officer, he was able to see that picture that I took from the phone on his screen. Oh, that's Chris, that's Chris's wife. And he basically I can sort of do that. So this whole internet of things where I'm taking a picture, pushing it to an ingest, now I can sort of take that, tag it, and do again, do that dance of modeling that data and pushing it to archive. So that's kind of been the story as we've, we've been sort of talking about. And again, these tiers, this transient storage, this global ingest of a cloud of a high performance tier, these are different endpoints scaled is con connecting to. It doesn't have to be scale. They could be S3, they could be filer based. They could be, you know, some, some type of, of access method there that we're going to get. We're going to tag and then do the dance, right, in terms of the data and AI. Now, the cold data problem is interesting as well. You think about folks that have had data on tapes for a long time, libraries of information. And again, what you used to see, and I, I would be that kind of person as well, is like, yeah, sure, you got a lot of data. And Doug was sort of talking about that. I create more data, it's hot, and that point solution grows, that data lake grows, right? And it's like, oh man, I got a lot of flash. I was like, great to see 20 petabytes of flash or 200 petabytes of flash. That's, that's awesome. A lot of folks are really happy there. But again, most of that data could be moved off of that kind of environment. Doesn't need to be on flash. Could be on HDD, could be on tape. And then what we're seeing in the AI, in the data in the AI space is let me go access that cold data and run modeling on that. So I can now start to go look at this cold archive of tape or cloud environments and feed that back in to the AI, the data and AI dance that we've been talking about. And that really just is, again, from this kind of picture, this kind of architecture, here's my archive that might be on a NetApp, that might be on PowerScale, on S3 storage, on tape. I connect to that archive, I can tag it, I can prepare it for doing the dance, and we again, we sort of have left foot, right foot, right? You can do Hadoop, you can do uh, uh, MLDL type of modeling as well. So that's how the story has been told over the, you know, the past couple of years. And it's sort of growing and evolving as those data lakes span multiple clouds, multiple NFS filers. We can connect to that with a global data platform and, connect, and show you that. And what we're sort of seeing and try to the problem we're sort of see, this is kind of an example. You'll see, you have a couple of folks, right? To think about asking a question. I need to find certain pictures of, you know, an environment, curb stones, right? And let's just sort of use what, what Matt sort of said earlier. How do I get that? You're dealing with a data engineer, talking to the sysadmin. The sysadmin's now having to go and figure out uh, to, you know, uh, oh man, this, this stuff is on tape or it's on a uh, Azure and we're at our limit of pulling data back. We gotta, we're really worried about that next credit card bill. So I got to coordinate with uh, the, the archive specialist, right? And that archive specialist is going to help me kind of move that data back and prepare it and have it to run. So you sort of, sort of do that and then you got to worry about the data transfer. So you've had a whole day's worth of just figuring out where the data is at getting the right kind of archive specialist to go find the data on the cloud, on the tape, and bring that back. And 
what we're having to do too is share security information, credentials. How am I going to get that data to, to and from? Um, and it's like, well, when is the copy going to finish? I don't know. I'm going to monitor it for you and let you know when it's there. So you're waiting for coast to coast kind of calls to sort of do that. And really, again, what you see is the amount of people that are involved, the exposure you're having, having that data be placed and copied multiple times is it's a security risk. It's a manual, time consuming. You're looking at if it's a tape, if you're watching your cloud budget and the egress kind of charges as well, you're providing credentials that really shouldn't have to be provided to other people that are in part of the workflow. And you're creating, the most important thing, other copies of the data, because you can't be certain that Archie or Dean or let's talk Shawnee deleted the data after they were done with it, right? It's like, oh, I just copied it there for you. I moved on, I'm on vacation, see ya. Right, and you now now you have that extra copy, lots of manual monitoring, not really supervising the whole process, the cleanup. You might forget to put stuff back to tape, and everyone is basically waiting on each other. I have no runtime prediction. That whole part we were talking about, data preparation, being spent most of the time. That's what's happening. All of that stuff is happening before I get to the Hadoop job, to the Spark job, to the DGX job. And that's really what we're trying to think about in that global data platform evolution. As I mentioned, we've sort of done this, we've, we've done testing like this with a global data platform with our uh, platform computing acquisition, LSF and Symphony and Conductor, where these resource management systems <clears throat> can tie in to storage scale, for example. You can actually have jobs triggered to go and have the data pulled to the site. And when your job's actually there, and going to start to run, it's already available. You're not you're not doing a an open and waiting for the data. The latency is not going to hit you. Sort of getting that. You can sort of coordinate that. And what we can do with the resource management systems is clean the environment up, remove the copies, remove the relationships that you set up talking to the cloud, put the data back to tape. So, so you can actually have that more automated. And what that really allows us to do is reduce the number of people <clears throat> that are involved. I'm going to now ensure that you're not exposing credentials to multiple actors. I'm going to ensure that your data is cleaned up. The fidelity of the data is now maintained. I've automated where the data that I needed is at. I've done looked at my data cataloging service, uh, um, pulled that in. Uh, I've actually detected the data has been on tape. Go ahead and do the recall rather than, again, Chris doing a cat star and doing a recall storm right from tape. If you've ever experienced that, not very, very pleasant, but I can sort of see what actually needs to be recalled and I can have the scheduler maintain the, the credentials for accessing the data. Seems like an incredibly elaborate process to get pictures of stones. It could, but again, that's a simple that's a simple ask, right? Now let's say I got maybe six or seven different parameters of images, right? I was like, give me all the times Chris went to this country in the last 10 years, right? So you could, this is a simple thing of curbstone. That's a good point, I agree. But it's sort of bringing that example. How can you now think of it in a bigger picture, right? All of us have a request, put that into a resource management system. It might could, be a city, it could be a city planning, Use case though, right? sometimes those are important pictures to have. Oh, well, cities like to do that as well. Yes. <laughs> so, so again, don't judge. You know, there, there's there's really just trying to show you how you can reduce the number of actors involved, ensure your data fidelity is there, and that's what we can do today. And the workloads that we're using the global data platform on. You heard Dave talk about the cloud packs. You know, I've sort of been mentioning Cloudera, HDFS, SaaS from an ISV perspective. Of course, NVIDIA, GTC is this week, right? And what we're doing there. And then again, these cloud data lake backup archive scenarios that are sort of there. Mm. <clears throat> and the deployments that you have, that's the unique thing that you have about storage scale, for example, is I can be in an appliance with our storage scale system. I can actually be inside of IBM products like PureScale, which is DB2. We talked about databases earlier and files. We actually, Netiza, Sailfish, actually run scale underneath it. So they actually built those on SAN, you know, kind of applications. And VMware over Fabric, sort of in there. And then Dave's Spectrum Fusion <coughs> environment runs there, as well as Erasure Code Edition. This is what storage scale 
can sort of run on. You're not limited to just one way of having the software run. And again, just to sort of see again, what I have, when I have data, you're thinking about when you create a data, you know the file name, the extension, the, um, who's, who's, who is it, is it Chris? And what project Chris is a part, part of? Thank you, Doug. So essentially, you actually have the ability to place data in a hot tier, in an HDD tier, or actually just have it go to the cloud right away. So you have that at that initial ingest point. And then when you need to read it, you just read it. You don't have to worry about CDing to the cloud directory or whatnot. You just do your open from the path and the data is read. So all this is provisioned through the policy engine that is there this where correct. it will be placed. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's a placement policy for when data is created. And then when I read it, I just read it. I don't have to, have to worry about it. How much effort is there in you know, like, obviously if you're in a real world business, right? You got all these data sources and all this orchestration, how much work upfront work is there to kind of build all this to make it useful and as predictive as you're making it sound? Yeah. I, I'm glad you asked that question. So it, like I said, I'm, I'm actually going to show, uh, hopefully it has not timed out yet. Um, but essentially uh, in, the, in the last slide here that I'll sort of get um, to here in a minute, there's actually a hands-on environment that shows you can craft these policies that I'm talking about through GUI, through REST API kind of interfaces. Uh, I'll, I'll be, again, all cards on the table. These policies used to be created very SQL-like. So if you're a da database admin, you're like, okay, I understand it. But if you're like you and me, you're like, okay, I, I did some ODBC kind of programming or you know, trying to do in the back of the day with Perl. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if I just had a, a nice WYSIWYG kind of thing for this. So we do have that today. So it is a lot easier to create that initial placement policy, to create policies for compression, for data movement. And I'll walk you a little bit through that as well. That's a good question. When it comes to scalability, <laughs> storage scale, you just add storage. You're no longer, you know, you don't, you don't take a downtime. You add more disk, you add more flash. There is no downtime. The storage is up. You add more clients and you can get to namespaces that are on the order of 200 petabytes. And right? that's essentially what we have up and running today. <clears throat> you can mix it in with, again, the storage scale system. Scale plays with scale nicely. So you can actually have, you know, different tiers of storage sort of coming in on that initial ingest. And then you can create these remote work environments of GPU storage, of Hadoop environments, and I can be selective in that resiliency service Matt was talked about, what data will be accessible to that remote cluster. So this, this remote compute cluster will not see the same data as here. I can make it so it sees the same data, right? But I can segregate what I share to that remote cluster. So I can now fence off and think about what we're thinking about in terms of a multi-tenancy strategy, what we can do with scale. Again, you can sort of see this all in action here, right? I got clients, I got storage, I got policy engine. Um, I may be accessing it via non-standard protocols and those different access methods are there. I may be pushing it out to S3 storage or tape. What's really unique and what this storage namespace can sort of do is I can, in, in this particular industry, it's a healthcare and life sciences industry. I've had customers that deployed, Chris, I want this as a scratch. I want this as a, um, a projects directory, and this is my archive. I'm like, sure, I'm happy to sell you the hardware that way. But I can also change that up and on the same set of hardware, put multiple namespaces. So I don't need to have a namespace. I don't have to have a silo for each of those environments, right? I can go back to this picture here, and I can have this in here, and I know how to use things like active file management to push data back and forth here. That's not a problem. But the uniqueness of what you have with a global data platform is I can just create multiple namespaces on there. I can do quality of service for each of those namespaces so that the scratch has a little bit higher priority than the project space, than the archive space. So how do you manage data movement? Because uh, as per the requirement, data will be available on different type of devices with different capabilities uh, and based on the policies it will also be it will keep on moving 
so with this thing in place when data is moved from one place to another place uh, that movement also costs network bandwidth compute and everything with so much of a uh, unified platform it looks like movement will also happen a lot uh, then how do you ensure that uh, new data that is coming in is not getting uh, troubled with this movement that is happening in the background so uh, do you uh, have throttling in place for that yes so that's actually a great question and and it was a lot of rfps i would be responding to is like well we have this life cycle management and we can push back and forth but it's like but i'm writing this performance to the ssd tier and you're going to move stuff off of there what's the impact right so we developed quality of service so that basically yeah. when i'm doing the data movement i back off there's io that's going on that has a higher priority that's a user level and again we've enhanced the quality of service so that you or i could have different you know let's think of the novice user for the, the the expert user right and i'm not saying you're a novice but you'll be the expert i'll be the novice but essentially you can have a higher IOPS or bandwidth you know, limit than I can, so I'm not messing up your system. So at the base level, from a system perspective and data movement, I can do quality service. From a user group level, I can do quality of service, right? So that's where we've been going with the product. So with, with all these facilities and policies also related to QoS coming into picture, it looks like the deployment or the usability aspect would have a lot of knobs and tunes to tunables to set it up so is the deployment complex in that sense or how you guys are managing that complexity so that user is able to uh, you know better utilize what is available yeah so so again you're you're right and one of the things we've actually been always accused of is there is too much bells and whistles that you have in your products IBM right uh, so what again what we've been trying to do is how do we make that easier to consume in terms of uh, GUI REST API interfaces but really what we're trying to strive for is, one of the things we've learned over time is never try to automate everything for someone. Because again, as I think it was Dave that said, you ask for something, but then the other customer wants something different. So a lot of the times we just put the bells and whistles in place. And then we start to think about in kind of where we want to go is AI knowledge and the operations that are going on. Oh, this is the workload that's taking place. Change to this parameter. And that's where we're going. So some kind of automation built on AI machine learning is also being worked upon. Correct. For automating the tunables and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Okay. We'll we've been uh, releasing certain uh, features of this every quarter and what Scale is doing actually are, are um, we just released a version right now. The next one, basically, again, we're thinking about how can it be more dynamic for what your application is doing. That's correct. <clears throat> From a caching perspective, we were talking about virtualizing a NAS filers, S3, you know, uh, scale kind of environments. But from a collaborative kind of environment, I think this is kind of interesting. At the high performance ingest from an instrument, I may be sharing with certain sites that I trust that they can write back. Those sites may be running scale, so I can read and write, you know, back and forth. But those other sites, I don't, I don't trust them to write. They're going to just have a read-only copy. I can also share with a site that's a research institute. They, they want to take some data. They're going to do some weird things with it. I do not want that data back. So I have kind of choice in how I collaborate with these kinds of environments. And I think we were talking a little bit about the architectures of what caching services we're doing. And this kind of delves into that. Data resiliency, that's, it. that's bread and butter for storage. You better be able to do an A and a B site. A site dies, B site you know, takes over. That's easy. But we're also seeing is people have been going to cloud and says, I'm going to cloud, it's S3, I'm done. I don't need file in cloud. And it's like, that's cool. We can push it to the cloud. You have your S3 environment. We can pull it from the cloud when you need to. But what we're also seeing is like, I need some help getting a file environment up and running in the cloud. So IBM Cloud, Amazon, our partners was like, I'll get you a file environment going. Still talks to your S3 bucket. And now I can collaborate with file. And to kind of close, like I said, we basically, you know, this whole concept of what active file management is doing, you really can think of having multiple scale instances, right, that is sort of talking, all talking to a common S3 storage. And this particular developer, right, may be working with only S3. And you may have a job that kicked off over here, has certain data already queued, and the data that's missing Again, you do this in the prologue or epilogue of kind of jobs that are there. What AFM does is bring the data for you automatically. 
no longer a manual copy. So that whole scenario I presented earlier on the security aspect of where, where is data that you're sort of working on, right? Now, all of these sites, they could have a global data platform on there. I can do data cataloging and they can still talk to filers, to S3, to other scale environments. And now I can present a solution from IBM that's not going to make you pay that GDPR fine. Right, so I'm going to make sure your data is, you always have the latest copy of your data. I'm going to reduce the number of resources that need to work to get to the data. And I'm going to give you that resiliency service on there where you're not sort of working about. So this is kind of the end story of where we're going right now um, and actually implementing with clients today.